Good day, everyone, and welcome to today's EDF webinar, Creating Thriving Oceans in Our Lifetimes. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, you will have the opportunity to ask questions during the question and answer session. You may register to ask a question at any time by pressing the star and one on your touchstone phone. You may withdraw yourself from the queue by pressing the pound key. For participants joining via the web, you may also type questions in the dialog box on the lower right. Please note this call may be recorded. I will be standing by if you should need any assistance. It is now my pleasure to turn the conference over to Ms. Amanda Leland. You may begin. Thanks very much. Hi, everybody. I'm Amanda Leland, and I direct the Oceans work at EDF. And I'd like to welcome you all today to our webinar. It's so great to have you join us. First, a few housekeeping issues. I'm just going to reiterate the instructions you just heard one more time. To reach an operator during the call, hit the star key followed by zero. To get in line to ask a question, hit the star key and then one. And if you want to post a question online, that's easy too. Just type it into the dialog box that you see on your screen and we'll read it out loud. Today I want to tell you about why we're more optimistic about the future of the world's oceans than we've ever been before. And, that we want, and then we want to open it up to a dialogue with all of you. But before I begin, I'd like to introduce you to a few of my favorite colleagues. Dr. Doug Rader, the Chief Scientist at EDF's Oceans Program. Hi, everybody. And Dr. Laura Rodriguez, who directs our oceans work in Mexico, one of the world's top fishing nations. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I want to start by talking a little bit about what's at stake. It's not an exaggeration to say that the fate of humankind is tied to the ocean. Within nine decades, nine billion increasingly affluent and urban people will compete for more food that will have to be produced from already maxed out resources. The challenges facing the ocean are many and complex. The impact of climate change on the oceans cannot be underestimated. Pollution and habitat loss are also big problems. EDF is focused on solving one of the most concrete and immediate challenges, one that is completely created by people and completely fixable, overfishing. We're simply taking too many fish out of the sea and nature can't keep up. The dominant story about the oceans is that we're in a downward spiral that will only gain speed as po the population grows and more people depend on the ocean for food. Most scientists believe that rampant, intensive fishing, which now occurs in every nook and cranny of the ocean, may rob us of the sea's bounty within just a few decades. So why am I optimistic? Because we at EDF have seen from the science and from practical experience around the world that we don't have to sacrifice healthy oceans for food and prosperity. We see a path by which the world can meet the needs of the hungry, ease poverty, nourish children, empower women, improve health, while conserving the bounty of the oceans for future generations. This is not just California dreaming, as they say, from Namibia to Belize and Denmark and Australia, Chile and the United States, Pragmatic solutions are slowing and reversing overfishing, reviving coastal communities, and bringing the oceans back to life. Here's the problem. The fisheries that are most at risk are either poorly managed with micromanaged rules that make the problems worse, or they have no rules at all. We see a different way, one that gives fishermen a reason to protect their fishery for the long term by granting fishermen and communities secure rights to fish. This creates a built-in incentive to fish sustainably because local fishermen and their communities benefit financially as the fishery grows. And if we can spread this approach around the world, we can have a future with more fish in the water, more food on the plate, and more prosperous fishing communities. Already there are signs that the tide is turning. Countries such as Canada, Norway, and New Zealand have made the shift to sustainable fishing. The European Union passed a law recently that requires an end to overfishing by 2020, and EDF is working with partners in Europe to make that new law a reality on the water. In the United States, two-thirds of fish caught in federal waters are now sustainably managed after a decade of work by EDF and our partners. 
Iconic American fisheries once near collapse are rebounding, while jobs and revenues have grown. One example, the West Coast's largest fishery, declared a disaster in just 2000, now provides enough certified sustainable fish to feed 17 million Americans their seafood for an entire year. It's a good start, but it's not nearly enough. Our goal is to have 50% more fish in the sea by 2025, and that will take significant change around the world. Seven countries, shown here in dark blue, have already largely transformed their policies and practices to sustainable fishing. We aim to add 12 more governments to this list of leaders, shown here in light blue. Together, these countries account for 70% of global catch. Reforms at this scale could tip the global system so that sustainable fishing can take hold worldwide. So how can we make this happen? Well, EDF and our partners have pioneered new science that uncovers a striking fact. Sustainable fishing not only leads to more fish in the water, it also increases the amount of fish people can catch and leads to more prosperity for communities. That gives all players, from government leaders to seafood companies to investors and fishermen and women themselves, a reason to support sustainable fishing because it's in their self-interest to do so. Before I tell you more about how we're achieving change on the water, let me turn it over to Doug for a few minutes so he can talk about the state of the world's oceans today and share more about this new exciting science. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, most of you have probably heard that our ocean faces a wide array of threats, and perhaps that intensive fishing is the most immediate and among the most serious of those threats. You've probably heard widely reported studies that show that something like two-thirds of the world's fisheries are depleted, and one that even claimed that by 2048, commercial fishing in the world's oceans would largely be a thing of the past. Globally, something like three billion people rely on seafood as a key source of protein. These people are concentrated in, in Africa, in Asia, in South America, in places where fish populations are dwindling rapidly and as human populations are growing, but also where a new middle class is emerging that is, that is hungry for culturally important seafood. These management failures that Amanda talked about related to fishing also threaten the prosperity directly for nearly 40 million fishermen and women who live mostly in small coastal communities with, with few other options. In, in the extreme, these fishermen with no fish turn in desperation to Ill illegal activities, including piracy, which is now the dominant alternative in Somalia and places like that. Back in the 1960s, marine scientists thought that the sea could produce tremendously greater amounts of seafood than was then being produced. In fact, as much as 400 million metric tons, 10 times what was then coming out of the water. Well, despite tremendous and rapid in, and continuing increases in fishing fleet size and power, fish yields peaked in the early 1990s at no more than a quarter of that, so less than 100 million metric tons. And experts today project that the world fishing fleet, despite continued growth, will be hard pressed to maintain even these really disappointing yields. You can see on this chart in 2015 where we are now that we're in this downward slide and that that downward slide uh, will continue, meaning that billions of people around the world who depend on fish will each get significantly less, such that by 2030 out to the right-hand side of the slide, the total amount of fish available per person will have fallen from that 1990s peak by about 40 percent, and the curve keeps going off the right. It just continues getting right and worse and worse. That sounds dire, right? Well, there's good news, and that is that by tackling overfishing head-on, we can unleash the ocean's natural resilience and turn things around. There are exciting examples of this breaking out all over the world, as Amanda mentioned. As she also mentioned, we are here at EDF leading new scientific research that suggests that the potential for, the, for this recovery at the world scale may be far greater than ever anticipated. In, fa in fact, we do believe that we can have our fish and eat it too. 
Working with academic partners, we've developed a, a huge database, the world's largest of world fisheries. We've compiled a new and powerful bioeconomic model uh, that projects the potential for healthy global fisheries. The results are in. They are being submitted this week to a top-tier science journal. Uh, we expect the specific results to be embargoed by that journal, but the exciting outcome will be announced at the World Ocean Summit in Lisbon, Portugal in a few months. I'll give you a sneak preview here today. At the global scale and in most individual countries, most places around the world, sustainable fishing leads not only to more fish in the water, but also to greater amounts of fish on the plate and also to greater prosperity for communities. Plus, perhaps most excitingly, management based on fishing rights, the solution that you have previously heard us refer to as catch shares, performs dramatically better than any other approach. And as excitingly, this recover happens far faster than anyone expected, in most cases in a matter of years, not decades. Back to you, Amanda. Thanks, Doug. Um, you've done a good job explaining why the science is clear on the benefits of sustainable fishing. But I think the big question that probably everybody's thinking right now is how do we actually get people around the world to change the way they fish? This is the tough nut we have to crack. Much of our effort will center on working with governments to establish fishing rights. Um, and we focus on this because it really does, th this particular solution outperforms other fishery management approaches in restoring fisheries for the long term and for improving the livelihoods on the people who depend on fish. Bringing people into the equation is a key part of success over the long term. So the core of our, the approach is providing secure rights for fishermen under a clear set of rules with an ownership interest Fishermen are directly responsible for the future of the fishery and they benefit when the fish recover. This puts conservation squarely in the self-interest of fishermen because it pays. In the United States, the system, as Doug said, is known as catch shares and it works like this. First, scientists determine how many fish need to be protected and how many can safely be caught each year. And then they set a total annual catch limit Next, portions of the total annual catch are divided among individual fishermen or small villages that cooperate in fishing. Because fishermen know how much they can catch each year, they can time their fishing for better weather and market conditions, and they can slow down their fishing to have less waste and impact on the sea floor. This reduces harm to the oceans and increases the market value of their fish. Finally, as the fish population increases, so does the share for each fisherman, creating strong incentives for fishermen to lead recovery. Fishermen also support more science to ensure compliance and to improve planning for future years. So to illustrate the point, let's consider what's happening in Belize. Despite a long history of piracy, the Belize coastline is becoming a global model for sustainable fishing. EDF joined with partners to launch two fishing rights programs in Belize in 2008. And today, fishermen are leading the charge for nationwide reform. To see why, just go fishing with Leonardo Cus. Four hungry kids and $3 per gallon fuel requires a whole lot of discipline. He catches his own bait, he cuts it with his handmade knife, and he uses a salvage rebar anchor he welded himself. Prior to reforms, Belizean fisheries were sorely being depleted. Some blamed Jamaican or Guatemalan poachers, but hunger also drove depletion from within. In the race for food, Belizean gill nets and dive fishermen stripped reefs and sea floors. Spiny lobster catches plunged from 200 to 20 per day, and fish populations dropped by a third. With fishing rights, fishermen's incentives flipped from catching as much as possible today to protecting the fishery to the, for the long term. Illegal fishing dropped 60% in the first two years. Fishermen, long opponents of nearby no fishing areas, became advocates for their expansion. Fish populations began to rebound. Success spread up the coast and brought hope back to the people of Belize. And today, 3,000 Belizean fishermen are demanding fishing rights nationwide. Not only is sustainable management restoring fish populations, 
but it's also helping to empower women, build local communities, and drive economic prosperity. One place we're seeing that happen is in Mexico, one of the world's top fishing nations. And Laura, can you take a few minutes and talk a little bit about our work there? Definitely, Amanda, would be my pleasure. So let me take you to a small community in the desert in, north, in the northernmost point of the Gulf of California in Mexico, the Golfo de Santa Clara. What if I told you that you are a fisherman in this community and that this year you are earning 23% a higher value for your fish? And what if you knew that as a fisherman, what you were earning this year, your revenue is up 8% from last year? And what if you were a fisherman who for three years in a row now has cooperated with the community to come together and make community agreements so as to not flood the market and have agreed to even put money towards improving catch monitoring and science? These are the changes that we are seeing in Golfo de Santa Clara, which is one of the four communities that fish for Curvina, a delicious salmon-sized whitefish popular all across Mexico. When EDF started working here, the, fish was caught, the fishery was caught in a classic race to fish, fishermen competing with one another to catch as many fish as possible as quickly as possible. It was chaos with lots of waste and inefficiency. Fishermen would dump all of their catch on the market all at once, sometimes causing prices to plunge by as much as 50% in half a day. The fishery was declining and the community was hurting. EDF joined with partners in Mexico to put a fishing rights program in place, a catchers program like Amanda and Doug mentioned, and things are turning around. There is a healthy population of Corvina in the water, catches are stable, and with higher prices and no price gluts, the community is starting to prosper. For me, it has been amazing to see this with my own eyes. I had studied the power of fishing rights, but over the last three years, I've been able to see the transformation with my own eyes. We have put in place innovative changes to help make sure everyone in the community can benefit. For example, women here one made, once made money helping untangle Corvina from nets and cleaning them after fishermen came back from trips. However, with the fishing rights program in place, fishermen themselves had more time to do this themselves. To help women maintain their income, EDF supported the creation of the first women-run enterprise in Golfo de Santa Clara the Sociedad Cooperativa de Mujeres del Golfo. These women process corvina and other fish into more valuable products like fillets. These women have a new and better way to be empowered, earn a better living, and play a leadership role in their community. Convinced by the success in corvina, members of Mexico's industrial hake fishery, which is in a neighboring community, approached us for help with their own fishing rights program, and other fishermen are expressing interest as well. There is certainly a lot more that we will continue doing to revive fisheries in Mexico, but I, what I see here gives me hope for Mexico's future. Thanks, Amanda. Back to you. Thanks, Laura. It gives me hope for Mexico's future, too, and I find this story really, really inspiring. Thank you for sharing it. Here's the thing. Overfishing is a human-created problem, which means that we humans actually have the power to fix it. Increasingly, leading scientists are recognizing that despite the dire predictions, there is reason for optimism. The ocean has great potential to heal itself if we can change course. This brings us back to what I call the more slide. We can do this. We can generate more fish in the water and increase the ocean's resilience to the unavoidable climate sho shocks and disruptions now underway. We can sustain thriving fish populations and let fishermen put more food on the plate each day to nourish the minds and the bodies of another 900 million vulnerable people. We can increase the prosperity of struggling communities around the world. So I'd like to open it up now to your thoughts and questions. Just a reminder, to ask a question on the phone, hit the star key followed by one. To post a question online, just type it into the dialog box on your screen and we will read it out. Thank you very much. Questions, please. <laughs> so Amanda, it looks like we have a question from the web to start out with. Um, you described EDF successes in Belize and Mexico. Can you talk about a few other places where EDF is having success? Sure. Um, I would I li like to talk about this all day long. Um, so. 
So a couple other places we're having success. One is the, um, the United States uh, Gulf of Mexico. So there's work going on in, in the uh, Gulf of California in Mexico. And then, then the Gulf of Mexico in the United States, this is basically the south coast, um, tremendous progress has been made. Uh, red snapper in particular, but also other species that are in, in economically and um, ecologically important. Um, fish populations have rebounded with a catch share program put in place just a few years ago. Fishermen are earning more money. And now um, recreational fishermen are seeing the potential for reform and are moving forward with catch share programs. 62,000 individual anglers went out on trips, fishing trips last summer in the Gulf of Mexico, fishing under catch shares and have really seen the benefits um, and the ability to, to ensure a productive fishery over the long term. This is the, fir the first in the world right, fishing rights program for recreational fisheries. And I can talk more about that if there's questions. Another place that comes to mind is Sweden, where we're working with both the government and fishermen to, um, to build out new catch share programs, fishing right pro rights programs. Um, for the nearshore fishery, which is culturally and economically important in Sweden. And that comes as part of um, the implementation of the EU policy I referenced that requires an end to overfishing by 2020. And in Philip the Philippines, we're working with other NGOs and local communities to uh, build local fisheries management um, to protect coral reefs. So there's a great diversity of places. EDF is actually on the ground in nine countries now. Um, and there's a great record of success in, a, in fisheries large and small. So I'd like to go to the phone now. Um, I think we have a question. We'll take our question from Linda Bailey. Your line is now open. Uh, thank you. Um, you hear so much about farm fish and uh, the danger of the health uh, to uh, wild fisheries. Could you say something about that? Uh, you haven't mentioned it. I don't know how big a problem that is. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Yeah, sure. It's a great question. And you're right, we have not touched on it. So um, I, there's two answers to this. And I'll start and then turn it over to Doug. I think one important answer is that um, the world population is rapidly increasing in the next couple decades, and there's a pretty clear consensus that um, it's going to be really hard to feed all of these people from the land alone. So the sea has to be part of the equation for uh, feeding the, the greater population. And fixing wild fisheries, which is what we've been talking about, is critical to making that happen. But there's also a really important role for aquaculture in feeding the world. Um, in particular, uh, aquaculture that has the ability to um, produce a lot of food, like, like farmed mussels or farmed oysters um, or farmed fish that are, are largely herbivorous fish. They, can, they, they grow rapidly. They're relatively clean in terms of environmental impact. And they can really provide a whole lot of food for people. A second answer to your question is about the health impacts of farmed fish. And I'm going to ask Doug to comment on that. Yeah, so let me start by amplifying what Amanda said first. And, and that is that increasingly uh, farmed fish, aquaculture fish, is an important part of the overall fish portfolio. In fact, just for the first time ever at the world scale, uh, farmed fish is now catching up to and passing wild uh, harvested fish, which, and, and in fact, as you go up that timeline I showed you with wild fish uh, uh, increasing, but not increasing very much unless we are, uh, until we are successful this way, the aquaculture curve keeps going up and up and up and up. And so th that, that has um, all kinds of, of uh, implications for people on the health front, but also for the environment. So if, if you look right now at where the, the chow, the feed, comes from that is used to feed much of that, it comes from wild sources. So you have the, the low-level uh, fish, uh, the, what some people call forage fish, forage fish, the little small ones that are important prey for other fish, and important, including predators and uh, game fish and things like that, B being captured and, and ground up and fed to to uh, farm fish, and in addition, those those fish farms are in many places in the world are often put into 
filled wetlands, uh, damaging habitats and even water quality in those places, but habitats that offshore fish require for their early life history stages. So there, when it comes to the environmental effects of fish farming, it, it can be done well or it can be done poorly. And, and, and at this point, because things are happening so fast, the, the, uh, the jury is still out. When it comes to human health, the same, the same thing is true. And that is, I think everybody knows that eating uh, omega-3 uh, fatty acid rich food is, is a good thing for people's health. And around the world, uh, countries want their people to eat more fish. Uh, on the other hand, if you feed these, uh, these farmed fish uh, materials that contain uh, toxicants, persistent toxicants, then they can end up in the tissue too. And so th in that sense, um, having better uh, reconnaissance sy systems, monitoring systems that check the health of, of, of all kinds of fish, both wild and farmed, is really important. Uh, to bring it back to what we're talking about now, another benefit of the Gulf uh, uh, Catch Share Program in the United States was that those fishermen were able to innovate and create a program called Gulf Wild that allows uh, volu wholly voluntary incremental food safety testing for those wild caught fish caught under the, the rights based system there. And so they, they are showing and certifying that all of those fish do, are in fact healthy to eat despite the Gulf oil spill that made people question the health of goldfish, Gulf based fish generally. This is, we could talk about this all day, so I won't. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thanks, Doug. Um, I think we have a, a question from the web. We do. Um, the question from the web is, and before I get to that, let me just remind callers that to ask a question on the phone, hit the star key followed by the one, or to post a That's a, that, sorry, <laughs> little technical difficulty there. That's a really great question. Um, so in terms of there being a competing view, so there's, there's pretty much the old way and the new way. Um, in some ways, th so the old way is um, what is typically happening in fisheries around the world, um, which is to try and limit things that fishermen can do. So they can have this size engine as a way to try and catch less fish, or they can have this size net as a way to try and catch less fish, or they can only go fishing on Mondays and Fridays, or they can only catch or, and keep this many fish in a day that they're out fishing. It's basically, um, it's sort of trying to control their behavior to the, to the extreme. And the alternative view is, you know, let's not talk about all of these details and let's actually talk about how many fish can be caught and let's ensure that there's an, a system in place so, so that fishermen don't go over how many fish can be caught. Because there's really no way to know how many fish are going to be caught just by saying you can only fish on Mondays and Fridays. Um, it's a really terrible corollary to a real um, total amount of fish. So those are really the two, like the two visions of fisheries management. And increasingly, the latter vision, which is fishing rights, is the more, um, I think, the more compelling vision and the one that governments are starting to look to. Um, I was just in Japan last week, a very exciting week of meetings with um, officials. And there, they're having these kinds of conversations. And there is an interest by senior government folks to start shifting towards um, fishing rights programs because they see it working in other parts of the world. I hope that answers your question. Um, I think we've got another question from the web. We do. Um, you talked about how fast fish populations respond. Do fishermen have to stop fishing a few years to make this work, and how do they, uh, I, I'm missing a word, by, uh, how do they get by during this period? Yeah, that's another good question. So this comes up a lot, um, and this is a question government officials always ask, right? They want to know how long are fishermen not going to be able to fish in order for the population to rebound. And the story of Corvina that Laura just um, talked through, and she can give some of the specifics, 
the fishermen actually took a pretty substantial cut in the overall catch in the first year, and they still made, the, the revenue still increased because they were able to be more efficient, get a better price, have better quality. So there's, there's typically a pretty significant um, uh, upside on the economics because of the reduction in waste and the improvements in the marketability of the fish that help offset some of the costs of having a lower cut and having a cut and catch. And another key point is that um, when fishermen have secure access to their fishery, when they know that this is theirs to protect and grow, they become advocates for lower catch limits, which is very different than the, the typical current systems. Um, in the red snapper Gulf of Mexico fishery I alluded to in, from an earlier question, when that program was just kicking off, fishermen came to Washington, D.C. and lobbied for a 40% cut in their catch limit. This is the first time this had ever happened. Um, and they did it, and they went to members of Congress's offices, I was there, um, and said, if I don't take this cut now, I'm not going to have a business in five years. So I'm willing to go through a hardship in order to make it through in the other end. And it turned out that even in the first year, um, their revenues were strong and, and have improved every year since. So in short, typically there's a cut and often there's, um, there's a way to, there, that between price increases and cost decreases, the economics um, continue to be strong. Another question from the web. Yes, we do. And before I get to it, let me just remind callers to ask a question on the phone. Just hit star key followed by one. To post a question online, just type it in the dialog box on your screen. Our question is, uh, one of the most challenging aspects of almost every environmental issue is getting individual communities and societies affected to truly believe that they will be better off by trading present behaviors for future-oriented behaviors. What communication strategies or highlighting of existing experiences from communities themselves persuaded those communities to buy into uh, and these substantial fishery management practices? I'm going to give you a couple of our really um, helpful tactics that we employ, and then I'm going to ask Laura to talk a little bit about how she, can, she and the team down there um, convinced fishermen and the Corvina fishery to take action. But one of those, um, one of the tactics that is really successful has ab almost nothing to do with EDF. <laughs> so we do fishery exchanges where we take fishermen from one community that have gone through the exchange to another community that's contemplating change and we put the fishermen in a room together and we close the door and we walk out and close the door. And we let fishermen basically tell in their own words their peers in other fisheries, how their lives have, are much better off, how their families are better off, how their communities are better off. And you know, there's nothing like that um, that we could ever say at EDF that will really drive home the point more to the, fisher to the other fishermen. So we've done this within the United States. We've done this across nations. Laura has led delegations between Mexico and Cuba. Um, between Mexico and British Columbia um, and, and, other, and other exchanges like that. And even language differences actually don't matter because when it comes down to it, fishermen talk in the same language. It just might sound a little different from one place to the next. So Laura, how did you, uh, how did you and the team in La Paz motivate uh, folks in the Gulf of California to want to wanna take action? Uh, thanks. Um, besides uh, bringing fishermen together, which I think is a very, very effective tool and, and uh, it has had a huge impact for, for our program when fishermen can talk to each other, um, I think that there are three things that we do that are really critical. So the first thing is that we go to them, the second is that we listen, and the third thing is that we design together. So just to give you a, an example, uh, in the Corvina fishery, that there's four different communities, one of which is an indigenous community. These communities, as you can imagine, are all uh, racing to catch Corvina and were caught in this race to fish. They were competing against each other. They were not talking. Uh, if anything, they were, you know, throwing rocks at each other. <laughs> um, not rocks at each other, but, you know, fighting when they, whenever there was a public uh, a, a, opportunity to get together. And so really one of the things that we needed to do and that the, the government doesn't have the capacity to do is to go to them. 
We go to each of the communities on the ground. We engage the fishermen. We engage the communities, not just the fishermen, so you, like you heard of, all of the, the, the people in the community involved with the fishery. Um, and then once we're with them, we listen to them. And actually, one of the things that I'd like to share with you about how we listen to fishermen is a tool that we have that has been incredibly helpful for us. And this tool is, is called the fish game. And the fish game is, is, is a, like, you, like it sounds, exactly like it sounds, it's a game. You put fishermen or any of us, if we were all together in the same room, we could all sit and play the fish game. But basically, you put fishermen together at a table, and you have a short game that you can play. But basically, this, this game allows them to recreate their fishery behavior and it allows them to start talking about their problems in the behavior, which gives us the opportunity to listen to the pe pe peculiarities of each fishery. Each fishery has its own problems. Each community in each fishery has its own problems, its own cultural context, its own economic context. And we need to listen to all of those because the third element that I was talking about, designing together, I think is really a key to success. So we, um, EDF is, uh, is, you know, invests a lot of time and energy to make sure that governments at all levels sit down with scientists and sit down with community members to design what a fishery management uh, system is going to look like in the future. And I think this is really a game changer because in a lot of countries like Mexico that are uh, centralized governments, a lot of, you know, solutions, quote unquote solutions can come from the capital and are sent down to a fishery, but they don't work. They're not designed together. They're not taking into account the local context. And so by really doing this work of going to them and listening and designing together, that is really how we can ensure that you have this behavior change because the fishermen are participating in the rulemaking. Great. Thanks, Lara. So another question from the web. Our question is, uh, Dr. Rader mentioned new science showing that sustainable fishing also leads to more food and more profits. Can you tell us a bit more about this new science and how more fish, more food, and more profits can all be possible at the same time? Doug. Glad to. So the, this upside comes from a perfect storm of opportunities, the way I think about it, where if you look at the world ocean now and the fisheries tied to it, the, they're, they're in poor shape. So in fact, this huge database shows that uh, on average, fisheries are being fished about 40% harder than they could be, even if they were healthy, and that they've already been depleted on average down to perhaps uh, three quarters of the lowest levels they should have to be able to sustain the large amount, largest amount of food coming out, out of it. So clearly part of the op opportunity comes from rebuilding the fisheries, rebuilding the populations, increasing the allowable catches, and then selling those in the marketplace. But I think as interesting as that is that a lot of the economic return in, and increased opportunity comes from being able to realize uh, lower costs, higher value for all the reasons that you heard about before from both Amanda and Laura, netting significantly increased profits. And again, I can't quite let the, let the uh, cat out of the bag, but, but these increases in profits are substantial. And in fact, something like three quarters of the total uh, overall upside comes from that increased financial opportunity that the uh, management uh, and ownership rights that, that you know, fishing rights programs bring to the fishermen involved. And, and in fact, in my view, that also helps, helps cover the transition cost and time from the question before. Um, so I think it's an, a really exciting uh, combination of those factors that brings fish populations back thus higher abundance, that allows higher, more abundant populations to be, uh, to be harvested fully, increasing yield, and then with the freedom by fishermen and fishing communities to get the most they can from the fish that they take, increasing profitability. Great, Doug. I think the connection to the potential for 
using some of the economic upside as a way to help um, bring financing to the table to help pay for some of the transitional issues that are associated with the reforms is a critical point that we haven't yet made already um, and one that will, I think, be catalytic in our ability to scale reforms much more quickly than we have in the past. And better science, have, uh, too. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I think we have another question from the web. We do. And just to remind folks, to get into the queue to ask a question, you can hit the star key followed by one on your phone, or just type it into the dialog box in the lower right-hand corner. Our next question is, you talked about working with fishermen in Mexico. What kind of relationships do you have with the Mexican government? Um, Thanks. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, Lara, please. <laughs> <laughs> in uh, finding my mute button, I... Uh, um, so in Mexico, we, we uh, have a fantastic working relationship with the, with the government at several levels. Uh, there is, uh, Mexico has uh, uh, a national fisheries commission, and we, we've just recently had a, a very close working relationship with the national fisheries commissioner and his team. Part of the, of the uh, not a very significant part of the work in Corvina, obviously, is uh, work that the Federal Fisheries Commission um, has done, and and one of the things that that uh, that is of, of that I am most proud of is is being uh, in this collaborative relationship, especially in Corvina, with with not only the Fisheries Commission, but also in Mexico we have a National Fisheries Institute, as well as state level. Uh, fisheries secretariats, and and really, it's it's essential uh, for all of the work to to have this very close working relationship with all of these entities at the different scale. One of the things, Laura, that I think is really also very powerful is um, is pulling together sort of the right team of people who have access to and can and are politically influential in the in the dynamics of a particular place. And in Mexico, you've built some really amazing relationships. I understand that you all had dinner recently with the, um, the, the fisheries commissioner or the, the fisheries yep. minister in Mexico. Yep. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's, a hard, that's, that's hard to get to. That's a hard, that's a hard place to get to. Um, and it demonstrates the, the credibility and the practical problem-solving nature that the team there has. And I think that's one of the keys to success. It isn't just that we have good ideas. You know, people often say ideas are a dime a dozen. It's being able to um, build the right networks and be influential and um, demonstrate success that makes this really possible, this kind of scaled approach really possible. Yep, I agree. And, and I think also, Amanda, what, what you were talking about with uh, you know, governments around the world uh, finding this new, looking towards this rights-based management system as, as giving them hope for fixing fisheries and recovering fisheries and having more, more fish in the water, more food on the plate is really is, is something that they're all looking towards because they've seen past management fail. And so I think that, you know, being able to have worked with the government together to, to, to secure the success in Corvina is, is really, is, is a huge, is a huge eye opener, I think, for fisheries managers around the world who, who all have in their minds the, the graph that Doug showed you of the catches going, <laughs> sliding down. So I think that um, we're, we're partners because we all have hope that we can, we can have more volume and more value. That's great. And I think it looks like we are out of questions, so I think I'm going to say thank you at this point. Um, and if you want to follow up uh, with any other questions, you can do so. You can contact Chris Weichel at C-W-E-I-K-E-L at E-D-F dot O-R-G uh, if you have further questions or to ha get a link to an audio recording of this call. Thank you, everyone, for dialing in today. Thank you very much, and have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Bye. This does conclude today's teleconference. You may now disconnect. Thank you, and have a great day.